Great guess. So, uh, John, two things. You say nationalism is the most powerful force in the world today. But when I look at a place like Afghanistan or Iraq, I don't see a national uprising against an American occupation. I see strong group feelings, but not that are coterminous with the way these borders are drawn. And, and at least in the Middle East, it seems to me that, that it's both sub-state identities, like being a Pashtun in Afghanistan, or super-state identities, like being a Shia Muslim, that are animating people's, that are mobilizing people. So you can talk a little bit about how those identities fit into your notion of nationalism. The second thing is, in, in some ways, not surprisingly, this is a very structural argument. Unipolarity drives liberal hegemony. It, it presents an opportunity. It, it presents an opportunity. But, but is 9-11 a real driver? Because up until 9-11, we kind of got liberalism in Eastern Europe and changes in Latin America. The things that Fukuyama talked about in the article without doing much, right? We didn't invade Latin, we didn't invade Eastern Europe to make them democratic. They, for all sorts of historical reasons like that, they defaulted to democracy like we can talk it. But after 9-11, we decided that places that didn't have that default had to be forced into the default. So how does 9-11 fit into this argument? Yeah. Just, l let me take them in reverse order and you'll remind me of the first one if I forget. These are both terrific questions. Just on the second one, to, to reinforce your point, you remember Wesley Clark wanted to use military force, force, ground forces, in the Balkans. And the Clinton administration refused to commit ground forces in the Balkans because we were so skittish. And you remember the 1991 Gulf War, George H.W. Bush of this institution, had a really difficult time selling that war because people said, oh my God, we're going to use ground forces. And they were thinking in kind of John Mearsheimer type terms, right? All this is to say that Greg is right, that 9-11 uh, that, that represents a big change. And let me just unpack it a bit. What 9-11 does is it forces us to go into Afghanistan. I think there is no president who can't go into Afghanistan to topple the Taliban, no matter what the price we will pay, uh, no matter the price we will pay, okay? We go into Afghanistan and we score what appears to be a stunning victory in a short period of time. We put Karzai in power and we, the Americans, basically get out. So it looks like we have found the magic formula for toppling regimes and then getting out of town. And just to build on this some more, think about the Bush Doctrine. The Bush Doctrine said that we're going to use military force against Iraq, but that's not the last place we're going to use military force. We're going to go into Iraq, we're going to repeat the Afghan model, then we're going to do Iran or Syria. When the Israelis caught wind in early 2002 that we were thinking about doing Iraq after Afghanistan, the Israelis sent a high-level team to the United States to say, are you crazy? Iraq is not the appropriate target. It's Iran. The administration said, the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, and the neoconservatives said to the Israelis, Relax, we're going, to do Iran. we're going to do Iraq, and then we're going to do either Syria or Iran. And we may not even have to do Iran because they'll throw their hands up. Because they'll see that we can float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, which is what we did in Afghanistan. So I would just unpack your point about 9-11 and say, it's not just 9-11, it's what we thought was the Afghan model it would lead us to be able to transform the entire Middle East at the end of a rifle barrel. And by the way, you wouldn't have to use military force more than one or two times before everybody was throwing their hands up. The problem was that we did not decisively defeat the Taliban, as you know. They were going to come back from the dead, right? And then we went into Afghanistan. That brings me to your first question. Look, uh, I was an adamant opponent of the Iraq war, and I knew a lot of academics who were also adamantly opposed. 
And I think there were two arguments against going into Iraq. One was the argument I'm making here, which is the nationalism argument. And the second argument, which is more consistent with what you're saying, and I think is correct, is that there were powerful centrifugal forces inside of Iraq. There were Shia, there were Sunnis, there were Kurds, and then there were factions within those different groups. And you're saying to me, John, that doesn't look like a national state, right? Especially when you look at the Kurds. And I think that that's true, right? But I do believe that there was a lot of nationalism in Iraq and that you got an insurgency against the United States because we were seen as occupiers. That was one foot dropping. The other foot dropping was the centrifugal forces. And you could go to countries like Afghanistan as well where you don't have one unified nation state. And as you well know, you can go to Europe and see much the same thing. Go to a place like Spain, look at Catalonia, look at the Basque region, look at what's happening in Great Britain today. But these are all manifestations of nationalism, right? These, a lot of these centrifugal, I shouldn't say all of them, many of these um, conflicts inside existing nation states are the result of nationalism at play. The gentleman